back to Fight Capital, where we step into the ring of combat sports business. I'm your host, Ryan Rappaport. Today, I'm joined by Tracy Lesitar smith Tracy is a principal and CEO of TLSK Advisory and is a distinguished senior executive with over two decades of experience in sports, entertainment, and government affairs. Amongst many prominent roles, she has notably served as a formal general counselor of NASCAR and Bellator MMA. And Tracy's made history in mixed martial arts as the first woman to ever hold the position of general counsel uh, for an MMA promoter where she played a crucial role in Bellator MMA's growth and global expansion. Above all of this, she is a wife, mother, and martial arts practitioner, and I'm eager to talk with her about her unique and invaluable insights that have enriched her personal and professional perspective in sports and entertainment. Tracy, I'm really excited to talk with you again, and I'm really looking forward to this. How are you and where are you joining from today? Well, first of all, what an intro. Thank you. I mean, you know, I don't I wouldn't ever need a walkout song. If 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 anything in your career doesn't work out for you, please come and be my hype man. This is a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure overstates overstates me a lot. Uh, but regardless, um, I am currently in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, my husband uh, was born and raised here. So we spend a lot of time here in this house. Uh, and uh, though I'm originally from California and lived a whole lot of places, including Chicago in the early days of Bellator. Well, actually, when I was making that intro, I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to fit it all in there because you've, you've done a lot and you've been a part of a, a lot of really cool projects, you know, working from, you know, in the government. And you know, I know you, you kind of got started out in labor and employment litigation, but you transitioned to a niche field like MMA. I mean, what, what drew you to make that move? Yeah, it's such an interesting question because I really do subscribe to the notion that a career is not a ladder. It's very much a jungle gym. Um, and I and I always say, well, I have two kids, so Disney is part of my content repertoire. And it's very much like in Toy Story where Buzz Lightyear basically bounces off a ball and tries to fly, claims he flew, and Woody says, you aren't flying, you're falling. A lot of people's careers go, mine included, uh, I am certainly no exception to that rule and take pride in that. Um, you know, I started out in politics right out of college. You know, out of college, you don't really know how to do a lot of stuff. And I was supremely lucky that I got to work for the late, great Congressman Elijah Cummings, right as he was about to take the chairmanship of the Congressional Black Caucus. And so, you know, working for him was entirely formative. I loved politics. I thought for sure I was going to simply continue in politics, uh, but fate had other things in store for me. In fact, the the congressman himself actually um, convinced me to go to law school uh, and then come back and work for him. Uh, and I think once I got into law school, I, I really I, I liked practicing a bit. Labor and employment was really interesting. Most importantly, I found a, a firm. I found a place that really fit me well. It was near where my family was at the time. And I just loved the people, right? So the work was interesting, but it's always really important, I feel, to like who you work with. And it's a litmus test for me on the projects that I take, sometimes the projects that I turn down, right? Is just, hey, we're just maybe not a good fit. But I think that uh, in this case, it was a great fit. And I had been a martial artist for many years at that point. A colleague of mine, J.R. Riddell, um, who is a partner now at Delfino Madden in Sam Sacramento, um, he and I were both training out of Uriah Faber's gym in Sacramento, which was truly amazing because this was really at a time when the WEC was still in existence, amazing lighter weight fighters in the world. Right. And so being in that incubator and watching it, but really just being somebody who was training, being a spectator, right, uh, was was a fantastic experience. And so through that, we were both practicing at this firm in, in Sacramento and uh, he was doing litigation. I was doing labor and employment. And we saw that there was this need in the combat sports industry for folks who really sort of understood the issues, but also understood a thing or two about the industry, right? And could really kind of use these two disciplines to talk to each other, right? And so early on, going to Team Alpha Male, we were helping some fighters with their contracts. And 
just trying to be helpful, really. But we started to notice that there was there was a vacuum in the endemic MMA media when it came to writing meaningfully about all of these lawsuits that were going on in the industry. And there were a number of them. Uh, and so he and I thought, I think we're going to try to fill that hole. I think we're going to try to pull the pleadings. We're going to try to write something that is meaningful for the MMA fan that they can understand uh, so that so that we can help progress the the sport and, and the media content forward. And that's what we did. So we were practicing litigators by day, uh, writers for SureDog.com by, by night. Uh, and at the time, SureDog was supplying ESPN with all of its MMA online content. So it's kind of funny because you could, I think you can actually go back and, and search on ESPN. You can actually find some of the stories that, that we wrote really early on. And it's, it's kind of this funny time capsule to go back to and take a look at. <laughs> but uh, so, so we essentially, we, we saw that there was a need and the industry had a need. And we simply started bringing in combat sports industry clients to the firm, which I'm sure for some partners at the firm was... Um, a bit strange, a bit odd, a bit untested frontier, but we were very fortunate. We had a partner who absolutely believed in us, in me, and said, look, bring these clients in. This is exciting. You, you are understanding the industry in ways that lawyers, other lawyers at our firm don't understand it. This is a growing area. Bring in the clients. I'll write the business and you'll essentially be the relationship partner. And I was still a relatively junior lawyer at the time. And so one of the, one of the uh, clients that we brought in was Bellator. And Bellator at the time was just getting acquired by Viacom. Uh, and so helping with that transaction was really kind of historic when you think about it. Uh, over time, Viacom from their initial majority stake, eventually took over the entire ownership of Bellator. But that was sort of the first step. And right around the time that I think I was starting to figure out that the billable hour was not probably my my favorite way to work at a, at a law firm, in the law firm environment, Bellator was figuring out that they probably at this point had reached a saturation, critical saturation point where they simply needed a GC. So it the timing was perfect. Um, I moved to Chicago, picked up everything, moved to Chicago. And then uh, eventually the entire company moved back to Orange County. Uh, and, and so that that is sort of the the odd falling version of, of the transition into combat sports. But because I had been a martial artist for quite some time at that point, it was something that I felt really changed my life. And so it was something that I could really be passionate about working in, if that makes sense. Hey everyone, quick favor to ask. Did you know that nearly 80% of the people tuning in right now aren't subscribed yet? That subscribe button down below is what powers me every week to keep putting out these podcasts. Big shout out and thank you to everyone that's been supporting me for this. I couldn't do it without you. If you're enjoying the content, please subscribe below. It means the world to me. And for everyone supporting me, thank you so much. Now back to the show. No, it does. And it's such a interesting and critical path, right? Not just being a part of the industry, but understanding the sport, being a practitioner. And I think that brings so much value as an executive and just someone who's working with it. I mean, you can tell that people who have passion and follow the passions and take that into their professional life usually have a lot more success. And I'm just curious, because as a first woman, woman to serve as a general counselor from an MMA promoter, what do you believe that you actually distinctly brought to Bellator? And was that unique or particularly impactful during that like pretty critical growth phase there? It is true that being the only woman in the room um, was a bit daunting at the beginning. But I think what you have to understand is that while Bellator itself was going through this astronomical growth phase, right? Because I was hired by Bjorn Rebney, right? And then eventually got to work and with Scott Coker and preside over that massive transition, right? And so while Bellator was going through this astronomical growth, though, the industry itself was becoming more sophisticated. And we're even seeing that trajectory continue, right? As we speak, the landscape may be shifting, 
right? Which I think is something that periodically happens in combat sports, a realignment, almost like politics, right? There's a, there's a realignment. Um, but, but the industry was becoming more sophisticated. Early managers, beginning managers, when, when I started at Bellator, are now some of the most powerful and influential and smart agents and managers in the game now, right? So I think what I was able to thankfully bring, what I was fortunate enough to bring was frankly stewardship, right? And I think that, I think that one of the things that's so fascinating about the European in particular, the European mindset and approach to sports is this sense of stewardship, this sense of this is something that we are going to build and maintain. And when we are gone, it will live. And, and so in my mind, presiding over that growth and being one of the team that really was able to help grow this incredible league to be what it ultimately was, um, I think that was in many ways an act of stewardship, right? And, and I think that what you try to do as a steward is you're not just taking care of it in the meantime. You're really genuinely trying to make it better, right? So, so in the time that you know, I was working, even before I was working for Bellator and during the time I was working for Bellator, and even you know, I still stayed involved you know, even during the years that I was working for NASCAR, right? I was still involved in the, in the boxing commissions and things like that, right? I, I think that if you, if you look at that, you see the gender parity, for example, start to get a bit better. When I started in combat sports, you know, there were a handful of promotions that had meaningful female divisions, right? And, and there were some folks saying, you will never see a women's fight headline a pay-per-view card. <laughs> Famous last words. Famous last words, right? Uh, and, and you look at it now and I think, I think on the field of play in combat sports in particular, you're seeing a lot more parity. Now, when I went to NASCAR, that was, that was, it was almost flipped, right? In combat sports, in the front office, you don't see a lot of gender parity at all, right? Especially in the senior levels. Um, but on the field of play, in the cage, in the ring, you are starting to see a lot more gender parity. Uh, in motorsports, I think that you see a lot less gender parity on the field of play, right? They're working extremely hard and very committed to try to improve that. Uh, but I think in the front office, you really see a lot more senior female executives and a lot more gender parity, right? So as, as somebody who is in this role, I really genuinely felt like it was my, my role to try to continue to push that and, and make that better, but also to, at the same time, make the sport better, right? It was, it was a truly transformative experience being able to, even, even to this day, being involved in, in making the regulatory side of the sport better and, and ultimately, you know, expanding into states and countries that for a long time were entirely against and wouldn't even consider legalizing things like MMA, right? So, so although my role was unique in that I was a bit unique at the table. Um, I think that the act of stewardship is something that is that is critical. In fact, I think it's existentially critical for combat sports that that people continue to to really feel that duty of stewardship to try to move it forward. It's not just about today. It's not just about the event two weeks from now. We really have to be moving this forward over over decades because you look at other historically well-established sports and they operate in decades. Do we operate in decades in combat sports? I think that, I think that we're moving into a stage of the business where that's, that's possible. Yeah. I mean, talking about that expanding landscape, I mean, we had, well, maybe it's a shrinking landscape in a lot of ways. If you think about like the AFL and NFL, when they merged in the late sixties, I mean, that happens. And during your time at NASCAR, I know you oversaw a lot of significant initiatives related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. How, how have those experiences influenced your approach to leadership and legal strategy in sports? Yeah, I, I think that um, creating, creating genuine, authentic diversity that sticks in historically homogenous sports is no small task. Uh, I think the most important thing 
that I have seen and been lucky and fortunate enough to, to work through is commitment. Commitment is actually critical. Um, when I agreed to go to NASCAR, that was something that was, it was really a deep topic of conversation in, in the process of, of my going there is that historically it felt as though NASCAR was rather homogenous and there, there was inside the building from the top, top, a tangible, palpable commitment that we were, this is the time we're going to make this better. We must, we will, we're doing it. Uh, and I think for me, that was a deal maker for me because I had come from combat sports, which although again, from a gender parity standpoint is not at its most ideal in, in the diversity of the industry, the ethno diversity of the industry is vast, vast and amazing it, more amazing because of it, because it is so vast. It's something that is celebrated, right? And gives so many of these athletes this unique flavor and really makes us want to watch because that's what sports is about, right? That's what the business is about. You want people to really care. They want, you want them to care. It, I call it the give a shit factor. I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss. You're allowed to cuss, yeah. I'm allowed to cuss. You're good. We call it the, the give a shit factor. <laughs> Right. You, you have, people have to care one way or another. If, if they think, if they think Chael is the greatest heel they've ever seen, I'm not mad at that. If they think that Michael Chandler is, is an incredible golden hero. I love that. Right. It's the middle that is no good. Right. So, so I do think though, that coming from a sport that was incredibly diverse, the commitment at NASCAR was really, really had to be there, really had to dig deep. And I was really lucky enough to, to be overseeing departments that were some of the most diverse departments already in NASCAR, right? And that's a huge credit to my predecessors that, that helped to really build that. And it was up to me to help the team and the board to take that to the next level. We weren't just going to try to maintain that in, in our our team, we were also going to try to really expand that, not just throughout the front office, we were going to expand that into the sport, right? Really, really deeply. And so I think commitment is key, but I also think the other thing you need is momentum, right? There has to be a point at which when things are stalling, you kind of create some momentum. And I, I hate to use a, a metaphor, a sports metaphor, um, but in in stock car racing, right? Drafting in stock car racing is basically, if, if listeners are not familiar with it, right? It's where the cars are essentially racing at high speeds, nose to tail, in a, in a line, on the line. Uh, you know, there, we're talking, you know, going upwards of 160, 170 miles per hour higher on a super speedway. Um, and what happens is in that line, because an aerodynamic, there's an aerodynamic effect that basically makes the entire line kind of cut through the wind, the wind and be able to create more speed so that when the car who's second or third decides to come out, they now have so much speed that they can actually hit the gas and overtake. They've created this momentum together so that then there's an opportunity created for them to overtake. And I think that's exactly, ironically, what the board and the sport really was able to do in NASCAR. You had this pandemic that had, it created this tragic and, and terrifying turmoil. But out of that, I think that we as a team were able to create the change that we really wanted to see in the industry right? Leadership and the board came together with this very intense purpose. And gosh, I mean, I remember after months of really strict social distancing at NASCAR, um, you know, which of course, you know, that's also part of my role is to partner with HR and the buildings and make sure that we are creating enough space and policy so that people can feel safe and they can stay healthy. Um, but after months of strict social distancing, at the top floor, uh, when we finally banned the Confederate flag, I remember one of my closest colleagues and I, we, we hugged, 
we hugged and, and cried for the, for the first time, um, in, in months. And it's almost, it was almost this, this explosion of just having the human contact and having done something that really needed to be done. Uh, and, and it was really an incredible time. And then, and then we were able to, to do things like usher in new ownership, right? Michael Jordan coming into the sport, Pitbull coming into the sport, other owners still exploring entry into the sport and making it a more inclusive place that, that, that fans wanted to be at, that, that drivers want to drive in, um, you know, and so I, I think the momentum is critical and you don't always, you don't always have that momentum. You have to sometimes really just create it. Right. And then I think too, you know, there's commitment, momentum, and I think you need to maintain, you need maintenance. You can't just make these changes. You can't just hire inclusively and then let it go. Because I guarantee you, most businesses have become very, very good at taking a look at their inclusivity and diversity profile and saying, we're not doing enough. We need to do more from a hiring standpoint, from a promotion standpoint. And, and that's fantastic, right? This is, the, this is a huge step. But maintaining it is another level of skill that I think businesses are still trying to put in their own toolboxes. How do we truly create an environment where we can maintain it? And, and, and NASCAR motorsports is a very stewardship oriented sport, right? Very stewardship oriented. This is a NASCAR in particular, stock car racing has been around for 80 plus years, you know? And, and so I think that, again, they are thinking in decades. So the decisions really have to be about what is it going to look like when I am not here? And there were really, I think once I, once I had my years at NASCAR, I think that they really developed a very deep sense of that, you know, and if you're, if you're fortunate enough to lead a team, for example, you know, understand that this is for this moment, you are helping to lead in this moment. You are helping to create something in this moment. I, I have to say I, my pet peeve is hearing a lot of people talk about leaders, especially talk about my team, my people, my departments. They're not yours. They're not yours. They don't belong to you. You are fortunate enough to be leading them in this season of time. And you need to treat them, the department, the people, the business accordingly so that it can, can, can succeed and it can be carried into the future at a time when you're not there. You know, um, so a long winded way of, of telling you some of the, some of the things that I was able to not just learn, but I think really galvanize in terms of my own leadership style, um, in the years that, that I was able to spend at NASCAR, what, what a ride. It was incredible. Well, le leadership can sometimes be impermanent. And w one of the interesting things that you were talking about is just the, idea of the international and global appeal of combat sports and how that makes it such a rich, uh, rich tapestry of nations, cultures, ideas, and people. And I think that's why we're seeing just that overtake and become one of the globally dominant sports, even if it's young combat sports itself as a young kind of, uh, uh, property rights holders, even though the UFC is 30 years old. I mean, when you're looking at, you know, soccer or American football or basketball, I mean, all those people have strongholds. And it's just, you know, as someone who's been able to go and see the world, I know that after your time at Nescar, you took a step down, you weren't traveled around. I mean, what insights and experience did your travels kind of give you that give you that kind of most valuable uh, perspective, both, I guess, personally and professionally? Well, I will say this. A lot of people, when my husband and I made the decision to just leave the United States and travel the world with the children, thought I was insane, uh, certifiably insane. So it was a momentous decision. Um, it was on our bucket list for a very long time uh, that we really wanted to, to take the kids and live abroad. During college, I had the great fortune of being able to live abroad for one of the years that, that I spent in college. My husband didn't get that opportunity and always felt regret that he, that he didn't get that opportunity. So it was something that we talked about even before we had children that we were going to do before the children got too old, such that kind of plucking them and, and placing them around the world could potentially be a little bit disruptive. So I think that 
I think that my best advice is that there is a lot of conventional wisdom around career path. And I think you need to forge your own path. And I was talking to somebody really recently about this, um, somebody who also is a female leader in sports, a longtime female leader in sports. And we sort of commiserated over the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people who want to tell you what they think you should do. Uh, we should be doing this. Um, and I, I just, I, I think that listening is a really important skill. And so I think you should always listen, but I think that ultimately you need to not oversubscribe yourself to everyone's opinion. They're all really important to be able to hear, right. And to be able to digest and, and work with, but I do think forging your own path is, is really important. And, and one of the things that I can say unequivocally, um, people who know me well will probably nod and say this is very on brand. Um, you know, I think that fear-based decisions are something that, that plague too many people. If you are making a momentous decision, a big one, and you really step back and examine it and feel like fear is primarily driving it, fear of what if I don't end up doing this down the road, we better get, go do this or fear of just generally, you know, fear about momentous life events happening. I think that if that is primarily driving your decision-making, it's probably not a good decision. If you have other reasons to make the same decision, fantastic. But if fear is primarily driving your decision, I, I, I'd urge and invite you to reconsider that decision because ultimately the, the residue that fear-based decisions leave on the bottom of the pan is regret, truly, in, in my experience. Um, and so I think for us, we made this decision to, to take time and to, and to go away with the children. And yeah, it, it was it was something that could seem in some ways a little bit terrifying, but for us, it, it was, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Will I ever be on my deathbed regretting that? No way. It was a life changing experience, you know, and, and I will say this too, for, for those who have children and families and are, are thinking of, of, you know, making big moves, children, really, if you are present and you are in it with your kids if you plant them, they will grow as long as you water them, right? My children, when we were living in Europe, my children went to an international school in Budapest. Right? I grew up going to Budapest because I'm first generation Hungarian American. And so that was sort of our summer vacation. And my children, it was miraculous to watch them thriving in this place and, and being able to you know, try some of the foods and, and, and see some of the things that I enjoyed during my summers as a kid. It's really exhilarating to be able to see them get to do that. Um, so I would say, you know, look, I love to work hard. In fact, you know, most people I would say me well would say I'm kind of known for being a bit of a grinder. Right. Uh, but, but I also think as an insight from the time that we took abroad with the children, your universe is not the only universe. And the more that you remember that, I think the better your leadership actually becomes. When, when your universe and your aperture close tightly around what you're doing and what the team is doing and just that, I actually think that, that your decisions start to become much more 100, 150 feet in front of your face and maybe a little less uh, overall for not just the good of the business, but also for the good of the people in the business, right? You know, when we, when we got to Budapest, we landed in Budapest one day after Russia invaded Ukraine. And this was an incredibly tumultuous time for, for Europe generally. And, and it was hard not to have that perspective and that universe really lead into your everyday life because it's just so much bigger than you, right? Um, so I think I think those are some of the those are some of the kind of larger 
things that I feel having taken time away and sort of wrenched my hands off of the wheel for a little while that I was able to really learn. And frankly, that our family was, was able to learn. Well, uh, both my partner and I have had the the blessings to live and travel internationally. And yeah. that perspective, particularly we, we live in a global economy and you never will truly understand what it means to work, especially with people around the world, unless you go and see the world and hear different perspectives. And we do, in as Americans, we kind of have this kind of very narrow view sometimes. But when you go to Europe, when you go to Asia, when you go to Africa, Latin America, all of those places, things are done differently. But you also are able to draw the similarities. And through that, you're able to kind of grow yourself and your, your personalities. And like going back to the world of MMA, it's what makes the sport and the growth of the sport. I mean, we see uh, leagues uh, like the UFC expanding their performance institutes into uh, Mexico City and China, Fel and Bellator going into Riyadh and then opening up deals in Japan. I mean, all of that is just kind of speaks to the global uh, reach of the sport. And it's just, it, it is a re MMA and kind of combat sports as a whole in terms of the property rights holder side of it is definitely uniquely young. But where do you see the future of legal practice within it heading and, and what areas do you think will become the most prominent and challenging moving forward? You know, I, I do think uh, that, as I alluded to earlier, the sophistication of the in industry continues apace. Uh, and, I, and I think that is something that, that is going to continue to influence and support the overall trajectory of the industry, right? Here's what I'd say. I think, I think it's really interesting right now to see a lot of fighters coming out of the sport and of their career, because, you know, the, I think that is actually going to cause and support a lot of movement in the sport, right? Um, the athletes kind of slowly, but surely beginning to feel their leverage. You see some of the bigger stars retiring and, and wanting to make their own mark, right? You'll see you you see these athletes coming out and they're they're working in the business and i'm not just talking about forest or or chael i'm i'm talking about folks who are coming out of the business and even going into the regulatory side right i mean you look at like frank trig that's he's what i was thinking right there yeah absolutely. i mean like trig is amazing he's a, he's a he's a hilarious person he is he is one of the biggest personalities that that I know and he is he is fitting like a glove right into that regulatory side of the business and you know look at Chris Lieben who is you know every time I go to a to a California fight now there he is and and I I can't tell you the deep satisfaction that that personally gives me because I think that that is going to be a key to keeping this business on the upward trajectory is fighters coming out of their athletic fight careers and figuring out how they are going to give back. Look, you know, some, some fighters may just want to move on entirely. You know, a lot of, a, a lot of my pals in the industry, we say, Hey, we love the game. But the game doesn't always love you back. Right. And, it, and it's true. And so, and so some folks just want to entirely move on. And that is brilliant, right? That's, that's great. Um, and I think that every athlete in particular kind of has maybe one, maybe more than one decision point in time where they decide how they are going to give back if they're going to give back. And so I think athletes will actually be the source of some of the most interesting movement in this business in the next decade or two, right? Remember, we, we want the sport to start thinking in decades, truly, not just years. And I think that's going to happen. I think we're approaching it. Um, but, you know, I also think the, the thing that I'm watching in sports writ large is sovereign investment and the capitalization of leagues, clubs, generally, right? How they're being capitalized all over the world. Um, you know, combat sports is interesting, but, but combat sports is just one of an array of sports that are being financed by, for example, you know, PIF and, and the sovereign funds. Um, and so I, I think that's going to be really interesting to, to watch 
as that continues to develop, whether some countries really and some, frankly, you know, some some leagues like UEFA or EPL, you know, try to start kind of curbing a bit how influential uh, those entities and these organizations can be. And, and also, too, sort of how how many times these enterprises can kind of dip in and become owners across the ecosystem, right? And again, that doesn't just apply to combat sports. That that applies to sports writ large. And I think that's happening on a micro level too. I don't think people realize that there you have like a brave uh, combat federation in Bahrain who've done this amazing job of not just building a, a smaller regional promotion, but the level of talent they have going in there. They have this amazing connection to the Dagestani uh, c- countrymen and people that they're bringing over that where you see people like Islam Makachev, Khabib Nurmagomedov, uh, Ilya Teporia, all of these, Johnny Walker, I could, the list can go on and on. The people that have come through their league and that talent talent that you have smaller organizations like that building up and expanding into Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, there's, it's happening. Uh, that type of capitalization and that expansion is happening at every level where even you have TKO and Endeavor essentially being like a government consulting agency in a lot of ways and some of the work they've been doing. A lot of people watching this are people that want to get a look into the industry yeah. and have a better understanding of, hey, how can I make a difference? There are people who are looking at it from the outside in. And I'm just kind of curious, what advice do you have for young attorneys or people in the legal industry who are looking to carve out their own niche in sports and entertainment? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, one of the most pivotal times in in my career breaking into sports was really, you know, I think I was at a conference and I, I got introduced to Big John and his wife, Elaine. And I can tell you they are... Um, honestly, some of the, the friends, my friends in the combat sports industry that I just adore the, the most. And I went early on and I did uh, Big John's refing courses and his judging courses. Um, and even when I would go to the Association of Boxing Commissions conference, their annual conference every year while I was at Bellator, um, I would often try to time the trip so that I could go and do the judges training that they do in the weekend period that happens before the actual business of the conference starts. Um, and so that really kind of, to me, speaks to the heart of, of my best advice, which is when you want to break into a particular industry, learn it, really get in there and pay your dues learning it because it will not only give you a better respect for all of the you know multifaceted aspects of the business of the sport but it will also i think endear you to the people who are running it at the top level your curiosity and your desire to learn it is really really important you know for example as a lawyer you know, you, you never want to be, you know, if I'm at, when I was at NASCAR, you know, I wanted to go down to the track. I wanted to see how the inspection system worked, right? I really, really deeply wanted to understand how it all works, right? And, and same with combat sports, right? I have a great respect and an interest for all the aspects of what it takes to put together a league, an event, one bout, right? And and it really, um, I think that it will speak to your credibility if you try to learn those things and it will endear you to the folks who ultimately um, can help you learn more, right? And, and if you try to jump in too soon and you want to sort of be a deal maker and you, you kind of can get in over your head a bit quickly if you don't understand all of the ecosystem, right? You can kind of get too big for your boots um, before you even get out the gate, right? I I love um, I love this I love this song by Stormzy. Uh, it's called "Too Big for Your Boots," and he says you're getting way too big for your boots, but you're never too big for the boot, right? We'll put you in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, I, I think that's, I don't want to say Stormzy's advice is the best advice. 
but but I do think that learning learning a sport and and really respecting all of the nuances in it will give you credibility. It will give you the ability to respect the other people that are in the business. And I think really lead to a a lot of lasting relationships. Uh, And I'm just so lucky to have my own lasting relationships in combat sports and motor sports. And I think part of it is, you know, getting in the trenches with your coworkers and really, really getting something done. Well, I guess now we know what your walkout song is. (laughs) <laughs> there you go there you go yeah well uh that's super valuable advice and that, that like i said that's always important just giving that that added depth to the conversation for the people who are listening and want to get that hey how, how, what does this mean to me or how can i participate and i think that's super helpful so I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I do want to be respectful of your time, Tracy, because I feel like every time I talk with you, I could nerd out with you for like another couple hours. So I don't want to take too much of your time today. And hopefully we can do this again soon when you have something new coming up here. But really appreciate you taking the time today because I think a lot of people are going to get value from this conversation, looking at it from the other side of the perspective, which is what I'm always trying to do is pull back that curtain. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I applaud your efforts. So it's always great to, to have a chat. I mean, I just appreciate your time as well. It's fun. Well, thank you so much. You have a great day.